Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Parker. I'm the founder of testprepchampions.com, which is a website dedicated to study skills and test taking tips. Those who know me already know that I'm a frequent contributor over on Quora.com, which is a question and answer based website where you can ask questions and get answers. Today in this webinar, I'm going to be sharing my answers to 21 questions that I picked out about the GED test. Now keep in mind that these are real questions asked by real people. And I'm not going to include the names and usernames, but I'll link to each question below in the description so you can check out the questions and you can check out my written responses for yourself if you'd like to. I've tried really hard to pick out questions that not only come up a lot, but that I also think are particularly interesting or offer some kind of unique insight. If you want to ask me a question on Quora, go ahead, you can use the links below. I do get asked a lot of questions over there, so unfortunately I don't always get to all of them. Um, but if you are going to ask a question, please mention that you saw this video on YouTube, and I'll do my best to give you an answer as soon as I can. So thanks a lot for joining us, as I said already. Um, I really hope that you guys find this helpful and that it really helps you with your GED test prep. First question that I'd like to address is how do you get a GED? In order to pass the GED test, you just have to go on to the GED Testing Services official website, create an account, and then you can sign up to take the test at a location near you. There are four sections of the test that you'll need to pass, and you can take them all individually. There's a math section, a social studies section, a science section, and a language arts section. This may sound pretty simple, but the actual test can be challenging, so it's best to make sure you're prepared first. The second question that I'd like to answer is, how do I achieve a good score on my GED? So my answer to this is basically take your time, break it down, little by little and work really hard and study hard and eventually you're going to get there. So besides these obvious factors that are going to play a role in your success, I'd also like to recommend that you set goals throughout the whole process. So there are, th there are three levels of scoring on the GED test. The first level is the 145 to 164 range. So to pass the section you have to score at least a 145 in it. Scores in the 165 to 174 range are college ready scores and scores in the 175 to 200 level or the college ready plus credit level. So if you score at this level, you may be eligible to get some college credits early. So I always recommend for people to pick a goal score, whether it's just to pass or whether it's to try to get in the college ready plus credit range, whatever it is, pick a goal. And once you have that big goal, your goal score, um, then set a bunch of smaller goals. So a smaller goal, if you're setting for the math section, might be to maybe take a day and work on fractions, work on exponents, or take a practice test. And I always tell students that if you achieve enough small goals, you'll eventually get to the bigger ones, which is passing the entire test. The third question that I want to answer is a really interesting one, and the question is, are there scholarships for getting 100% on the GED test? So the answer is yes, absolutely. But you don't necessarily need to get 100 on the test to get a scholarship. And so what I usually tell people is that the hardest part about getting a GED scholarship is actually finding the right one to apply for. So I think the best place to start is to make a small list of some of the colleges that you're interested in applying to and getting in touch with them either by email or by phone and just asking them directly if there are scholarships for your GED score. A lot of times your nearby colleges are the ones that are going to be the easiest for you to get a scholarship for, um, but also you can search the internet. So you can just run a, a Google search. And so there's a couple different things you can try during your Google search because like I said, it can be pretty hard to find some scholarships. So let's say for example, you live in Texas. You could maybe search Google Scholarships Texas, something like that. Um, you could also try adding, try experimenting with some Google operators, which I'll put a link to this below. Um, but so basically there's different ways you can search things in Google. So if you put quotes around something, like if you search GED scholarships, Texas, put it in quotes, that just tells Google to return, um, results that exactly match what you just typed in. Um, so there's other things like GED scholarships plus Texas tells Google to return results with both GED scholarships and Texas in it. Um, so there's different tricks like this you can use to try to kind of narrow down when you're searching on Google to try to find your scholarships. Um, so between your Google searches, um, just using the internet and reaching out to people, once you have a list of some of the scholarships that you want to apply for, 
I say go ahead and do it. So obviously if you have really good scores on the GED, you're going to be in a better position to apply for scholarships. But I always tell people to go ahead and try anyway. Set your goals high. Um, but set your goals high because you never know what's going to happen. So I can assure you that the scholarships are out there. You just have to look for them. So once you do find some scholarships that you want to apply for, make sure that you triple check the requirements before you apply. For example, if there's a scholarship that's for single moms and you're not a single mom, you're obviously not going to qualify, so you're not going to want to spend your time doing this. So first make sure you're eligible. Then if there are any essay questions, um, go ahead and provide good answers. Be honest, be sincere, tell your story, put some thought and effort in, and I'm sure you'll do well on any essay questions that you're asked. So... If you get really high scores, like a 175, say, in each section, something really high like this, and you find scholarships that are near you at schools you're interested in, you fulfill all the requirements, I, I almost guarantee you that you'll get a scholarship um, because a lot of scholarships out there, a lot of people don't apply for them. So if you score really well and you put some effort in, there's no reason why you won't be able to get a scholarship. Question four. What is hard about the new test than the old GED test? So in 2014, the 2014 version of the GED test was implemented and that's still the current version that is being that is being used today. And so the 2014 test is designed to be aligned to the common core standards and to focus on preparing test takers for college readiness. So this makes the test more challenging and another factor is that the test is computerized. It's estimated that the test takers will need to be able to type at a rate of at least 25 words per minute to complete the test on time. So this can make it more challenging if you're not used to doing a lot of typing on the computer. So I also just want to add that I really hate seeing students struggle with the harder test. And I think it is a little bit harder than the older version. Sometimes when I'm working with students, I see them doing things that and I think, wow, I never, I never learned this in high school. And... I'm not even that old, I'm in my 20s, so some of the students that I work with are, are much older than me, and so they probably really didn't learn this stuff in high school. So yeah, I, I can empathize with you that, yeah, it certainly is a harder test than in previous years before the 2014 test, but just because it's it may have gotten a little harder doesn't mean anything other than that it's going to require some more preparation. It's a challenging test, but I truly believe that it's more than doable for anyone who's willing to work hard and make the sacrifice required to do well. So don't let it scare you that the test might be harder. Harder doesn't mean anything other than that it's going to be a little bit more challenging, that's all. Question five is another really great question. The question is, after I finish getting my GED, where can I start school to become a pediatrician? So this is a great question. It shows that the person that asked it has a lot of ambition. So I'm just gonna kind of give a brief breakdown of the process. So to become a pediatrician, you're going to have to go to medical school. And so the typical path to getting into medical school for someone with a GED would be to first get the GED, then either enroll in a community college or a four-year university. Um, or if you're starting at the community college level, start at community college, get really good grades, transfer to a four-year school. Um, if you can take the GED, go right to a four-year school, great. But the name of the game is to get into a four-year university and study really hard, get really good grades, and you're going to want to get some shadowing experience with pediatricians, different doctors, some relevant work experience. If you can work as an assistant, anything in medicine like that, that would be great. Research experience in medicine, and you're also going to want to do some community service volunteering and join some clubs. Try to get a leadership position, like maybe become a board member or a president for a club, do some tutoring, mentoring, those types of things. Um, are what a typical med school application would entail. And you're also going to need to get some great recommendations from doctors you've shadowed, professors, other mentors, people like that. And so you're going to want to do all of this while you're an undergrad. And also, you have to take the MCAT, which is basically a standardized test that everyone who wants to go to med school has to take. It covers the basic science curriculum that you're going to have to go through. So your typical courses, you can basically major in anything you want to major in if you want to go to medical school. You just have to take the prerequisite classes for med school, which basically usually they include a year of general chemistry, a year of organic chemistry, 
at least one year of biology and probably some other biology classes beside the basic ones, uh, one year of physics, and a biochemistry class. So this all sounds challenging and it sounds like a lot, but that's because it is a lot. Becoming a pediatrician is very tough and requires a strong work ethic and lots of determination. So that being said though, if you really want to do it, you can find a way to make it happen. Um, just do the best you can with the GED. Take it a day at a time. Don't get overwhelmed and just remember that what I've outlined here is just a general process for some of the stuff that you're going to want to do to eventually get your application ready to apply. So good luck. This is a great goal and I wish you the best of luck in achieving it. Asks asks about uh, the best resources for learning the GED subjects. I think that Kaplan's book, I think it's called the GED Test Premier, you can get it on Amazon for less than 20 bucks. It's probably the best place to start as far as getting a general overview of all the sections, and then you won't have to buy a separate book for each subject unless you need extra work in a certain area. It also comes with two practice tests that are extremely valuable, and you can get some online content as well through Kaplan that people say is also really good. In addition to Kaplan, Khan Academy, the YouTube channel, is completely free. It's, it's really awesome. A lot of people really like Khan Academy. I'm a big fan of Khan personally. Also, Patrick JMT is a, another great YouTuber that makes excellent YouTube videos. And I think that he's a little lesser known than Khan in the GED community for people studying for the GED test. But I think Patrick JMT is also great, just like Khan. I think he's just as good as a little different style, but definitely also worth checking out. Other people really like Sailor Academy. It's a website with free courses that cover a lot of topics that you would need to know for the GED test. And in addition to Sailor Academy, uh, I also want to mention thattutorguide.com. Um, the guy's name is Chris. He's really cool. He's a Stanford-educated tutor, and he has you can get a GED math playlist. I think it's you can get a $7 free trial for a whole week, and you can watch most of the videos during that time if you time it well. And that way you don't have to pay for the whole month. But if you do pay for the whole month subscription or longer, it's definitely well worth it. The videos are great. Like I said, they're really high quality. He's a really great teacher and just a cool guy, great sense of humor. The videos are really enjoyable to watch, really helpful. And so in addition to this, I also want to add that um, reddit.com, the GED subreddit, is a really awesome place to go because it's a, just a great support community where you can ask questions, learn from people who have passed the test, aced it, done well on it, and also learn and discuss things with people who are studying for the test right now. It's probably the number one community on the website if you like, on the internet if you like, forums and message boards, places where you can interact with others. Um, that's again, reddit.com, the GED subreddit. So also, I, I can't resist throwing in a shameless plug here, kind of preaching the choir, obviously, if you're watching this video, but we have some free math videos on our channel and other videos I want to get a lot more posted shortly. Also on our website, we have the Champion's Guide. It's uh, kind of our main GED product right now. It's got over 200 math practice problems that cover essentially everything that you need to know for the test with in-depth solutions. We also give away a free 50 problem practice sample that's pretty in-depth and other free content. So check out our website. Again, kind of preaching to the choir because I know you're watching this video, um, but I couldn't resist throwing that in there. Also, probably the number one thing that you can do for yourself though, above all else that I mentioned is go on the official GED testing services website and take their practice tests. Any practice tests you can take are great. More practice is always better, but the official testing services website, it's a gold standard. You got to do it. Go on there, take their practice tests. I think it's like $6 a test, something like that. So it's not really that expensive considering the cost of maybe not passing a section and having to pay to retake it. Um, so go ahead and check that out, the GED service official practice tests. Everyone says that your scores on those tests are going to be really close to the real thing. Also, the practice tests I've heard are very similar to what you can expect on the real thing. So definitely go ahead and try that out. Question 7 is, would I be able to get into a reputable university with great community college grades and a GED? The answer is yes. In fact, I mentored a student who transferred to Pitt, where I went to undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh. She got her GED and passed the GED test, got into a community college, and then eventually transferred into Pitt. I had another student that I worked with for a while who got his, passed the GED test, got into community college, and then got into a great four-year school for computer engineering. So there's plenty of examples out there, lots of people who have done amazing things, and you can be one of them. Excellent community college performance demonstrates that you can handle the workload required to do well at a great university. And I also would encourage you to really uh, just let your story shine if you have any kind of application questions, like essay questions on your applications, interviews for colleges, 
uh, just really tell your story about you know what you learn from your experiences, and I really think that you'll have a great shot at getting into a good school. Moving right along now with question eight. The question is, am I a failure for getting a GED, and will it be harder to be successful? So to the first part of the question, my answer is no, absolutely not. Don't ever let anybody tell you otherwise. Everyone has their own personal reasons for taking the GED test. High school's not for everybody, so you have to do what's going to work for you, what's going to make you happy. So, no, it's absolutely false. Getting a GED does not make you a failure in any way, shape, or form. Many very successful people that I've known personally have gone on to become nurses, truck drivers, computer engineers, teachers, university students, lots of other things um, after starting from passing the GED test, and someday you can have your own success story to tell. As far as will it be harder to be successful, this is a tricky one to answer because success is something very personal, but my response is that it's only going to make it harder if you let it make it harder. You know, if you let it become an obstacle, it's going to be an obstacle. If not, then, you know, you really have no limit to what you can achieve here. You can't really help the circumstances that you come from. As I said, everyone has their own reasons for taking the GED test. The most important thing is to play the hand that you're dealt in life. Play it well, go after your dreams with everything you have, never stop trying it. Eventually you can be successful at whatever you want to be successful at, regardless of where you're coming from. This brings us up to question 9, and this is a very important, very serious question. I get asked something like this a lot from different people, but I wanted to respond to this person in particular. He asked, should I graduate high school and maybe get my diploma or get my GED? And so to give some context here, this person was a senior in high school. He had done very well up until senior year, had taken AP classes, honors classes, very good student, good track record, and he was having some trouble with depression. He was really struggling. And so the first thing I want to say here is that to anyone watching this or listening to this, if you ever feel like you're suffering from depression or any other mental health condition like anxiety, ADHD, or PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, I think the best thing that you can do for yourself is to get help, to reach out to a counselor or a professional that you trust and feel safe talking to. And I think that I've always thought that getting help for yourself is a tremendous sign of strength, it's a sign of maturity, it's a sign of responsibility. It shows that you're taking responsibility for your life and the outcomes that happen to you. So that's what I think is probably the best for you to do. Um, so I also want to add here that I can relate on some level here. I'm obviously not in your shoes. I'll never be in your shoes, so I'll never be able to fully understand the challenges that you may be facing at this pivotal point in your life, but I can still relate on some level at least because when I was in high school, I myself, I had some bouts with depression. I had some bouts with anxiety, so I know firsthand that it can really be debilitating sometimes. It can really feel hard to get up out of bed in the morning and go throughout your normal daily routine. It can really kind of break your will. And it's really a shame because it sounds like you have a tremendous amount of potential here. So one way that I always try to have people look at it is to just really stop and think about what's going to make you the happiest in the long run. Because it really is about you. It's about your life. It's not about anybody else. It's about what's going to be best for you. So another way to look at it is to just kind of stop and just picture 10, 20, 30 years down the line here looking back on your life. And do you think that you would regret taking the GED instead of leaving, instead of finishing high school? Or do you think that you'd look back and think that leaving high school, getting your GED was the best decision you ever made? So it really is two different paths here, high school or get your GED. Um, don't ever let anybody tell you that getting leaving to get your GED is the wrong choice. Um, because some people, the environment's just not right. Some people leave high school, they go to charter schools, alternative schools. The change of environment is the best thing for them. They really flourish. It's a great, better match for their learning style, and they really take off. Other people, they leave, and they self-study on their own or take prep classes, and they do really, really well with the GED. As I've already said, you can get college credit for doing the GED if you do really well on it. So either way, you can't really go wrong. I think that in your case, since you're a senior, you've already done very well. I would really strongly recommend trying to stick it out, trying to finish high school. And the reason is, is just because... You're a great student. Um, the GED is going to test you on the basic stuff that you've learned throughout your four years. Is going to test you on the foundations of the basic knowledge that you'll acquire that you've already acquired in high school. So at this point, do you really want to go back to square one, review everything you've already learned, take the GED test, or do you want to try to stick it out? And once you finish at the end of the year, you're going to be done. You're going to have your diploma. You never have to worry about it again. So I think that that's definitely worth thinking about. But as I've said a billion times, I keep saying it because it's so important. It's really about you. It's about your life. It's about what's going to make you happiest in the long run. So don't be afraid to talk to your family, friends, different teachers, different 
people at your school that can guide you here. Make sure you're talking to people that you trust that are going to look out for what's best for you and your best interest. But um, yeah, it's it's a personal choice and good luck to you with whatever you choose to do. I really hope you're feeling better. I really hope that you can nip this depression in the bud and come back um, swinging here at whatever goals that you have that you want to achieve in the long run. So good luck. We're now at question 10. And the question is, why should you work hard to graduate from high school when you could just bum around and get a GED as an adult? So I'm actually really glad that you asked this question because it gives me the opportunity to clarify something very important. Some people may think that passing the GED is an easier route than finishing high school. However, this really isn't the case. Keep in mind, I'm speaking here from both my personal opinion and from my first-hand experiences with tons of students who have said that this isn't the case. I think that the main danger with this kind of thinking is that some people figure they can just drop out whenever they want, it's going to be easy, the GED is somehow um, an easier alternative than high school. And like I said, the danger is that many of them end up not ever taking the test once they realize the kind of effort they're going to have to put in. Sure, it's true that some people just fly right through the GED test without much preparation. However, I can assure you that those people are the exception. Most people are going to require at least a little bit of preparation, if not 20 to 30 hours worth, which is pretty typical. If you're not used to doing this kind of thing, 20 to 30 hours may sound pretty daunting. Um, but keep in mind, I'm talking 20 to 30 hours over a period of a couple weeks, a couple months. And, you know, there's really no set time, like the time that it should take people. Everyone's going to be different. But the point I want to make here is I want to reemphasize. Um, I really don't think you can just bum around and get a GED. Um, I don't really get the impression that you want to just bum around. I don't, I don't think that. Um, but I just want to set the record straight once and for all that, yeah, the GED is not an easier alternative than high school, at least not for the majority of people. So I really encourage you to do some reflection on why you want to take the GED and also review the requirements to pass the test before you make your decision. On to question 11, how long does it take to get a GED? This is another question that I'm asked very frequently, and a lot of times students don't like my answer because I don't really give them an answer. I think that it can vary depending on your background, depending on where you're coming from. If you've been away from education for a while, it's probably going to take you longer to pass the test than someone who's only been away for a year or two. I've known some students who have passed the test in a matter of weeks, and I know some students who have taken a year or more to pass each section. It just depends personally, um, but there's no, there's no time that it should take you. It really takes you however long it takes you, and then once you're done, you're, you're done. You can move on. You can put it all behind you. Um, that all being said, I think that three months is a pretty good time frame to aim for for most people. Um, but the most important thing is to not worry so much about how long it's going to take and just get started. Just start, work on it a little bit at a time, work on it every day. If you can start a daily routine, that's great. One really easy way to sneak some of your GD prep into your daily routine is to get in the habit of reading every day, whether it's books, newspapers, magazines, blogs. I think one of the fastest ways to improve your score in all sections is to just read more because a lot of the test is going to be testing you on reading comprehension, whether it's the language arts section, which is definitely going to test your reading comprehension, social studies, science, even the math, you're going to have word problems, you're going to have to be able to follow directions, problem solve. Reading is one of the most important skills you can develop for this test, hands down. So the more you read, the better your reading comprehension is going to get and the better you're going to do on the test. So I think that, you know, the important thing is just start studying, do it regularly, develop the habit of working hard and focusing on your goal, and let the time take care of itself. Let's go on to question 12 now. Question 12 asks, is there any other high school alternative except the GED test? So first and foremost, yes, there is also night school and cyber school, those types of options, um, but if you're asking specifically, is there another kind of test like the GED that you can take? To that, the answer is also yes. There's the TASC spelled T-A-S-C and the HISET spelled H-I-S-E-T. Those are going to be available to you to take depending on your state. Now, they cover similar content. There are some differences, which I won't go into here because this video is primarily about the GED test, but just be aware that they're similar, but they're not the same. I'm just going to read some of the states where they're offered. The task is offered in Indiana, New York, West Virginia, California, Illinois, Mississippi, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Texas, and Wyoming. The high set is offered in California, Hawaii, Illinois, Iowa, Louisiana, Maine, Massachusetts, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Texas, Wyoming. 
So wow, you can see there are a lot of different places that offer these kinds of tests. So if you're in one of those states, um, definitely check it out. Some states don't even offer the GED, they just offer the high set or just offer the task. Um, some states offer both. You're just going to have to look and I should just also say that um, the states that I just read for you, that's off a list of some research I did back in March 2017, a month or two ago. So depending on when you're watching this video, you might just want to double check before you start preparing for any of these tests to just make sure that nothing's changed in your state. Um, some t states are supposedly going to be adding more alternative tests. Some might be getting rid of them. So yeah, definitely check on it before you sign up to take one of these tests or especially before you start studying for these tests. Um, but yeah, the short answer to this question is absolutely. Moving right along with question 13, are there calculus questions on the GED? The answer is no. You don't have to worry about any calculus for the test, and you don't have to worry about any trigonometry either. Question 14 asks, can I get into MIT with a GED? And my answer is sure, why not? MIT is a very, very competitive school. It's one of the best schools in the world, but I'm sure somebody has started with a GED and then gotten into MIT before, and if not, you can be the first person to do it. If you can take both the ACT and the SAT and perform just as well as the average incoming MIT freshman, and as long as you can demonstrate in other ways on your application that you'd be competitive with the average incoming freshman, I'd say it can happen. You never know. Try it out, and if you get in, let me know because that'd be, that'd be a really, really, really awesome thing to accomplish. Question 15 asks, is a GED necessary to enter a military program? So the only program that I know of is called the Army National Guard GED Test Plus Program. It can give you the opportunity to join the Guard without having a high school diploma or a GED. I'm going to put the link below to where you can find out more information about this. But as far as I know, all the other branches do require a GED or at least some other kind of high school equivalency test. However, I think that it's a good idea to reach out to your local recruiters because they might know of some other opportunities that would be a good fit for you. Your interest in serving our country is very admirable, and I wish you the very best of luck with whatever you do decide to do. On to question 16. 16 is, is 36 too old to start an education from GED to college grad? So those of you who are fans of this YouTube channel or have followed our stuff before will know that I've addressed this question before, but I wanted to include it here again because I think it's a really important one. And the oldest known person to have ever completed a GED, a GED was a 97-year-old woman. She was 97 at the time. I'm not sure how old she was now, but her name is Evie Aves, and she did it at 97. So if you feel like 36 is too old to do something like this, compare that to 97, and you'll see that it doesn't sound so bad. Now, this might not make you feel much better, but I can assure you that you have to start somewhere, and once you get your GED, you can get into college, get your degree, so the whole rest of your life ahead of you in a relatively short time, probably four, five, six years at the most if you start now. So you never know what can happen, and I say go for it. Why not? And we're getting towards the end here. Only a couple more left, and we're at 18. 18 is how easy is the GED? So my answer to this is basically that it can be easy if you're prepared well and you've studied hard, put the work in, then you're going to get through it without too much trouble. Um, but... I don't think it's an easy test, and I'm really not just saying that. Um, a specific example of why I say that is because I remember I was tutoring a student at the library. He was working on a science question, and it had to do with phase changes in chemistry between solid liquids and gases, and yet had a phase cha change diagram. I can't remember what the specific question was, but I remember thinking, like, wow, like this is this is pretty tough. And so I was a chemistry minor when I was in college, so I knew what it meant, but it was something that I really had to stop and do a double take. Like, wow, are they teaching this in high school? I don't really remember learning that in high school. Um, so I, I knew it from college, but I was just, I was really kind of surprised that that was on the test. Some of the other stuff too that I see in the science section and in the math section and all the sections are sometimes causes me to do a double take. Um, but you know, so that being said though, um, when you're studying for the test, you're going to know how to do that stuff. So it won't be that bad if you're prepared for it. Um, but the main thing is to just take it small, um, take it, take small steps, and you gotta get started. Just work on it, and it's not gonna be that bad if you put the work in. Like I said, question nineteen: What are some methods for studying with attention deficit disorder? So this is a question that really resonates with me because I'm the type of person who can focus on something for hours if it's something that I'm interested in. But if it's something I'm not so interested in, I have a much harder time focusing, and I have to put forth a lot more effort to stay on task. And so, like I said, this question resonates with me because I've had to work really hard to stay on top of focusing in classes throughout my time in college that maybe weren't so, that weren't so interesting for me. 
Um, so if you actually have attention deficit disorder or ADHD, if you're diagnosed with it, um, it's best to talk to a professional. There's a lot of behavioral modification techniques out there that work wonders, as well as medication approaches, which I'm nowhere near qualified to be talking about that. So I'll leave that up to your doctor to talk to you about. But um, anyway, I just want to go over a couple things here. So whether you actually have medically diagnosed ADD or ADHD, or whether you're just an average person who has trouble focusing every now and then and you need some help, um, here's some good tips that I want to share. So my first tip is every time you think of something that you have to do, write it down right away. Um, a lot of times when people go to study and they feel distracted, it's because all of a sudden they start remembering things. Oh, I forgot to take the trash out. Oh, I forgot to do this. I forgot to do that. Um, that always happens to me sometimes when I go to sit and focus on something. I think of a billion other things that I'm supposed to be doing. So my first bit of advice is to just write everything down, put it down in writing. Whenever an idea flashes in your head, get it down in a notebook or a planner. Check it every day, every morning, get in the habit of doing that. So that way you really get it all out of your head. And so when you go to try to focus and concentrate on something else, you're not going to have all this other junk interfering with it. So my first tip, write things down, write them out. Um, and my second tip is uh, just try to take deep, slow, calming breaths. Really just let your stomach fill up, breathe all the way up, fill your chest up, um, hold the breath, you know, and let it out slowly. Deep, slow, calming breaths and just kind of get in a rhythm. Like if you've ever practiced a musical instrument or learned how to play one, there's a thing called a metronome that just keeps the beat. You can set it and it'll just keep going. And you can just hear the beat, hear the beat, hear the beat. And anyone out there who's a musician will know that it's um, hard to stay on beat sometimes. And But anyway, so that's kind of what you want to think when you're, you're doing your deep breathing. Just deep, slow, calming breaths. This way it keeps your mind clear. Try to just relax, let go of all the tension in your shoulders, your wrists, your back, neck, wherever it is. Just try to just let it all go and let the mind be calm, let your mind fall still. Um, so a good way to do this would be to kind of do meditation, Tai Chi, some people like yoga. Um, I've done some meditation before off and on. It's not something I do regularly, I haven't done it in years. I, I tried it for a little while and I do think that it helped me feel like I was a lot more in control. It helped me focus better. I think that, um, well, I know that there are definitely studies out there that are showing meditation has a lot of benefits for your attention span and that you can help get better grades. So it might be something worth looking into. I tried it. It didn't really work for me in the long run. Um, I just didn't really like it after a while. It made me feel kind of strange and I just kind of got sick and tired of sitting there with a the timer, you know, eyes closed, meditating. So it didn't work for me, but a lot of people say that meditation is helpful with attention span. Um, so Here's another tip, and this is probably one of the most helpful ones that is just really good in general for study, studying. Try to study in short intervals. Um, if, you've, if you're not someone who reads regularly, just sitting down, opening up a book, and trying to keep your mind on it for 20 minutes and keep your mind focused on the book and nothing else, that can be kind of a daunting task. So um, that's a good way to practice your attention span is to just work on reading, and that also helps you with your test preparation. And also, um, whenever you're studying or reading, just set the timer, or give yourself a goal, 25 minutes. Um, that's a good place to start off with. Uh, it could be even 15 minutes, whatever you want to do. Just try to just focus just on what you're doing in front of you for that time period. And then as soon as the 25 minutes elapses, take a break and do something rewarding. Take a quick 5-10 minute break, stretch break, you know, go get a drink, whatever you want to do. Um, speaking of that, uh, when you're studying or doing something that requires a lot of focus, your brain is actually using up glucose, so you're going to need to replenish it. Um, so it's good to take sips of Gatorade, sips of juice, anything like that to help keep your blood sugar up while you're studying or doing work. So once you get 25 down, move on to 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 45, you can go up to an hour. I think that after an hour, that's a good time to just take a break anyway, even if you really feel like you're in the flow. But Breaking it up into shorter intervals and rewarding yourself with a break is a good way to help build up your attention span. Just kind of think of it like a muscle. You're going to the gym. Um, you, you lift more weights. You get stronger. You build your attention, attention span up by setting um, a time limit, making yourself pay attention for that time, and slowly increasing it until you can go up to about an hour. Um, so then another tip I want to mention here is study in a quiet place. Try to eliminate all distractions. Um, if you ever studied at a library where it was quiet, you couldn't really talk or play music or talk on your phone there, 
um, that's kind of the perfect environment. Um, you know, I always tell people, don't listen to music when you study. Try not to check your phone. Um, unless, of course, there's an emergency, but try to keep your phone out. Keep everything away. Just work somewhere quiet. Um, studying in a group can be useful, but um, it's sometimes distracting if people have trouble staying on task. So work by yourself. Um, work or work with a smaller group. You can work with a larger group too, but if you're just working on your focus, I would just clear all distractions. Just sit, force yourself to sit with some difficult, challenging material. Just really give yourself a time limit, wrestle with that material for a little bit, and you know, get it in your head, work on it. Then when you're done, take breaks. And so you'll do this, you'll build up your focus. Um, you know, so a lot of times when you sit down, you first start trying to get into something your mind's going to kind of jump around all over the place. A good way to think about it is like when you're driving in a car and you're listening to a good song on the radio and all of a sudden maybe you go around and turn, you go up a hill and you hear static. You hear the song kind of cuts out. You can hear it as well. You keep driving, you go a little further and the music comes back in and then maybe you go around another turn, you keep driving, keep driving, and all of a sudden you know you go to a place that you get the static sound, you can't really hear the song. That's kind of how you can think of attention span. You know, it's in and out, it's in and out. You know, you always have your attention on something but you know it's going to go in and out so the main thing though is that you know you're in control of your focus you're in control you got to control your brain your brain's not in control of you you're in control of your brain you control where you focus your attention and if you keep your attention on your goals keep your attention on what you're going to do and try not to get distracted you're going to eventually get to wherever it is that you're going okay we're about to wrap up here we have this question and we have one more after this Question 20, is it possible that some employers give preference to high school diplomas and not GEDs? So since you asked, is it possible, um, my answer is, yeah, it is possible. I think some probably do. I don't say this to discourage you. I just, I want to be, you know, I don't want to lie. I want to be as truthful as possible here. Some people do. Some people are going to have their biases, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it other than make sure that other parts of your application are strong. But, however, I think most people won't. I think that the majority of employers out there, this is not even a big issue for them. They're not going to show any kind of preference. There's way more people out there that won't care than that will. Um, but since you asked if, it, if it's possible, yeah, anything's possible. Some might, but I think that um, it's getting better and better for GED test takers to compete as time goes on. Ever since the 2014 test that came around, the, the version is now recognized for helping people succeed in college and helping people succeed in the labor market. So um, whenever someone talks about, you know, the 2014 test is so much harder than the previous versions, that's because it's it was changed to help you, to help you make you better, to help make the GED test takers better to succeed. And so maybe you took the, the version that was earlier, maybe you haven't taken the GED test yet, I'm not sure exactly what your specific situation is, but I don't think this is something to worry too much about. I know that this can be a source of anxiety for a lot of people because jobs aren't easy to come by nowadays, but I think that um, if you haven't taken it yet, focus on getting as good of a score as you can. Like, if you perform in the college ready plus credit level, you can score in the range that shows that you're already performing at the college level. I think that this actually shows that you have more aptitude than the average high school student who maybe hasn't done any college level work yet, but I think that, you know, regardless of taking the GED test, that's a very smart move. I think that it shows a lot about your intelligence level and work ethic, so I think the best thing to do is to just put your best foot forward here and send a lot of applications out. You know, have a positive attitude, keep setting goals at positive goals, and I think it's going to work out for you. We're now at question 21, the final question. And before I go over the last question here, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. If you've stuck with me this far here, and I really hope that this video has been helpful so far. You can follow us on Twitter, on Tumblr, Pinterest, subscribe to our email list, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, any kind of support, give a like on this video, a thumbs up. Um, but just by being here watching this video, you're already supporting us, and I really appreciate that. So here we go. Go through the last question and send you on your way here with hopefully a lot more stuff that can help you really achieve the score you want in GED. So... Exactly what math should I know to score well on the GED test? So, no one can really tell you exactly what's going to be on the test. That's a, an important point. Um, no matter how many practice tests you do, there's going to be different questions. Uh, you might see similar questions, but you're not going to see the exact same question, most likely. So, here's a rough breakdown of the math section, and um, here's the numbers. I think I got these from the GED Testing Service official website, so look, look there. I'm um, pretty sure that's where I got this from, but... Here's the breakdown. 
number operations and number sense are 20 to 30 percent of the test. Measurement and geometry is 20 to 30 percent. Data analysis, statistics, and probability is 20 to 30 percent. Algebra, functions, and patterns is 20 to 30 percent. So that's a rough breakdown there. Um, so pretty even split between everything. Um, so let me just give you some things that you should know. Um, you're going to, first of all, want to know the basic stuff like recognize plus signs, minuses, division signs, multiplication signs, be able to tell uh, less than, greater than, equal to signs, not equal to signs, and also you're going to want to have the basics down like addition and subtraction, multiplication, division, be able to do these kinds of operations with fractions, understand number of lines, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, with operation, any kind of operations with negative numbers, exponent rules, factoring, and how to use the quadratic equation, also the FOIL method, first outer inner last. You're going to want to have some practice working with percents. Um, there's some formulas you can use. Um, well, really only one formula and a variation or two. That That's how I teach, at least, that can really make you make percent problems easy to understand. Um, when it comes to equation questions, the main thing is you're going to want to know how to calculate the slope, how to find the equation of a line. By the time students learn how to look at a graph and see, um, see an equation plotted on it and calculate the slope, then write out the equation of the line just by looking at it. Um, that's something that's pretty complex and involves a lot of different math skills, so that's usually a turning point in sessions with students I've seen is once they can go through all that, they're usually pretty good for most of the math section. Um, you're also going to want to know how to find the median, uh, the mean, median, and mode. You're probably, I would almost guarantee that you're going to get at least one question that has to do with mean, median, and mode. Make sure that you can read and solve problems with bar graphs, line graphs, pie charts. Um, they're also called circle charts sometimes, and other graphs. And you're going to want to be really familiar with solving algebraic equations. Basically what this means is getting x alone on one side or getting y by itself on one side of the equation. Um, you're going to want to be able to find the greatest common factor. Um, those questions can be kind of a pain sometimes. They're not really that hard, but they can sometimes take a little while to figure that out, but you're going to want to be able to do that. You're probably going to get a question with that, greatest common factor questions. I think someone told me that that was like the first question on a test or one of the first questions. Well, the great common, greatest common factor question uh, and make sure that you can identify the ones, tens, hundreds, places, and numbers. And those are different. If you hear, if they tell you to find the tens place that's different than the tenths place, hundreds and hundredths, those are different places. Thousands versus thousandths. Um, so, you know, just be aware that those are different things. And um, you're going to want to know how to round, know how to estimate. Um, you're also going to want to be able to do calculations with the simple interest formula. Those are pretty simple. Um, there's a formula you can use in our guide. We go over a couple different variations of those problems. They're probably going to come up. You might get at least one, um, so don't be thrown by it. Um, when it comes to geometry, um, a lot of people, they skip the geometry for some reason when they study, or they don't do much of it, but that's definitely a big mistake. As we saw from the data at the beginning, um, at least 20-30% of the test is measurement and geometry. Um, so you're not going to get a whole, whole, like the whole test isn't going to be like half geometry, nothing like that, but you're going to, you're going to get some geometry questions. The Pythagorean theorem is a given. You've got to know how to do that. You're probably going to see a question or two on the Pythagorean theorem. That's basically triangles, right triangles, um, given two sides of the triangle, can you find the third, that type of thing. Um, know how to understand circles. Definitely know to tell the difference between the radius and the diameter how to calculate the area of a circle, how to calculate the circumference of the circle, um, and know how to find one given the other. If you're given the area of a circle, know how to find the circumference and vice versa. Um, make sure that you know the difference between the area and the perimeter of squares and rectangles. Um, not that hard, but it can be a little tricky sometimes, and you're going to want to get some practice um, just using general formulas. You might see some questions that just say, find the volume of the sphere, find the area of this cone, and you're going to have the formulas that are given to you right there in a problem, or you'll just go back to the formula sheet on the test. So you're not going to have to memorize the formulas, um, but if you are going to memorize formulas, just pack, stick to the Pythagorean theorem. I can't even talk. The Pythagorean theorem and the circle stuff, like area, 
Um, make sure that the value of pi, like if you see the little pi symbol, that just means it's a really long number that goes on and on and on. I don't think anyone's ever gotten to the end of it, but um, it's 3.14, the approximated value of it. So if you see the pi symbol, you can also use 3.14. Um, let's see what else you need to know. So make sure you can master all this. Definitely understand functions. Um, there's a lot of good free resources out there on YouTube to help you understand functions. And so other than that, um, you know, of course, this isn't, I didn't just, I didn't tell you every single thing that you could possibly need to know because nobody can. But if you understand everything that I just told, that I just talked about, um, you're going to be in great shape. You're going to know all the basics and do a lot of practice. And from there, uh, really, it's all going to fall in line. Um, also, know how to, um, what's, what am I thinking of here? I can't, ah, I can see, I can visualize the problems in my head, but I can't think of the name. Oh, um, know how to solve system of equation type questions. Those come up a lot. Um, and just generally try to always, when you approach math questions, always just kind of think, um, try to kind of categorize them in your head. Like think, okay, is this a, circles problem? Is this a FOIL method problem? Is this a fractions problem? Kind of think of your mind like a filing cabinet where everything's filed away. Like all your, the different things you have to know for fractions, how to go from a mixed number to a proper fraction, during an improper fraction, improper fraction to a mixed number. What is a mixed number? What is an improper fraction? What's a proper fraction? Those are all the things, some things that you need to know for fractions besides adding them, subtracting them, multiplication division. That would all be like, you know, one file. Um, so, you know, think of all the stuff you need to know, like a filing cabinet. So you see a problem, and the first thing you want to do is kind of think, okay, what kind of problem is this? Is this a fractions problem? Bam. You know, pull out the mental file of all the different things that you need to know that you've learned, mastered about fractions, and, you know, just go from there. Um, definitely look for keywords. Some people say, oh, don't, don't use keywords, like, when you're doing word problems because, like, it doesn't, help you understand the problem. Um, it doesn't help your understanding. It's just kind of like a memorization tricks. I disagree 100% on that. Keywords is in, you know, words like, um, words like sum, that type of thing, sum, product, just words like that. Like if a question says, you know, what is the product? What is the sum? If it says, what is the sum you're going to add? If it says, what is the difference you're going to subtract? Those types of things, and um, for some people that are strong in math already, this might seem like common sense, but to others it, it might not be, um, but don't worry, you'll get there. The, the key thing is, you know, just practice a lot, do a lot of practice problems, and you'll be okay for the math section. Um, it can be hard for a lot of people. It probably is the hardest section, um, but if you just, just keep trying, just keep working on it, you're going to get it eventually. And so, like I said, this is the end of the video, guys. Thank you so much, so, so much for watching. Um, can't say that enough, and if you want to get a jump start in the math section, like I've been saying, you know, you can try the Champion's Guide. I worked really hard on it. It took me actually a really long time to write, at least six months or so, um, even longer though, because I had really been, the way I just tell the story really quickly, um, you know, I tutored students for many, many years. I started uh, tutoring GED prep students. A couple years ago, and I we went through all kinds of different math material, and there were some things I liked, some things I didn't. But I just got kind of like you know, I'd see students come to sessions. They bring five or six different books with them. We'd say, okay, let's look at you know problems of this type. So we'd go to one book. Let's look at problems of this type. We'd go to another book, and we'd go through this, and we'd go through that. And I just didn't feel like it was really that productive. So I'd start bringing worksheets of problems that I designed, and I try to take problems and combine different kinds of math topics, different kind of things that they would need to know. So that way, problems weren't just testing them on one skill. They'd be covering a couple different skills, try to make the problems harder than the stuff that they would see on the real test, um, or at least at the same difficulty. Um, so that way they would be prepared um, because the programs we were using, they would, you know, we had textbooks, we had material. I didn't really think that it was aligned as well as it should have been to the real GED test. A lot of people said that they felt like they were working really hard and they got into the test and it was completely different than what they saw. So that was one of the main reasons why I would bring, um, I would bring worksheets that I would make, problems that I would make up for my students to do because I got tired of basically seeing them go into the test and get their heads kicked in after they'd been working hard. And um, so eventually I started putting it all together and, you know, I, I kept, as I was tutoring with students, like I'd see um, how they would respond to some of the problems. They would, some of them, like, you know, the instructions weren't clear, change the wording a little bit, things like of that nature. Um, but it was really a 
multi-year project, something that I actually sat down and started writing the book um, that probably took about at least six or seven months in the making, if not more. And so, like I said, worked really hard on it. And if you try it out, there's 50 problems sample. That sample alone covers most of the stuff I just mentioned, actually. All the stuff I just listed here, a lot of that is covered in the sample. Obviously, not all of it. Um, but a lot of it is, so that alone might be enough to get you to pass the test if you combine it with a practice test or two. Um, but anyway, so again, said this again, I'll keep saying it because I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for watching this video and look for more content from us in the future.